A quality workbench is one of the most important tools for a workshop and having a modern one is even more crucial. It gives the my room to design and create. In my journey of metal fabrication, I believe there are certain welding products that are the first stepping stones. For me, it was building a weld fixture table for my home garage to help me bring my ideas to life. Hi, I'm Rod Sochenda, and in this video, I'll take you through the DIY process of how I built this welding table all from scratch in my garage using basic tools. So kicking off this project, my main goals in mind for this table was it needed to be large enough to fit my needs and be able to hold pieces in an accurate and repeatable way. This was what I was working with before. It was a cheap welding table for small and simple projects, but for anything larger, the garage floor was my best friend. But like many home garage floors, it was somewhat flat and there's a saying, you can only build something as flat as a surface you have to work with. The small table and uneven floor wasn't cutting it. I found it difficult to accurately hold parts in place and struggled to keep it flat. I spent a few weeks researching different fixturing tables to buy, but they were all really expensive. At the end of the day, I decided to take a plunge and design and build one from scratch. This meant I could take the best features from each welding table that I researched and apply them into the welding table I was planning to build. Before I order or cut any materials, I jumped into my favorite 3D program SolidWorks to maul it all out. Some people like to build as they go, but working first in CAD enables me to see the design in 2D and 3D before anything is made. It also helps me identify issues early on. So let's break down the table design. So when building a weld fixturing table, I think these are the four main important factors to consider. One, a table top size and hole pattern. Two, table height. Three, mobility and leveling. And four, tool storage. You should also add to it for anything that is crucial for your workflow. Because this table would be used in my home garage, I went with an overall dimension of 67 inches long by 43 inches wide and I used a half inch thick plate. I feel like the 43 inch width is still a reachable distance but I'll have to walk to the other side of the table and using a half inch thick plate would take the abuse and would less likely warp over time. For the hole pattern I chose to go with a standard 5 8 diameter hole on 3 inch center. Commercially the tables I've researched are about 2 inches on center but going that route would mean I would have to drill. 693 holes versus 273. There's a universal rule that says a comfortable table height is close to waist level. I use my office standing desk to get a realistic sense of feel. For me, I measured something around 34 inches to work best. The standard seems to be about 36, but if I ever needed more table height, I think I could just add some blocks underneath. I wanted a table that wasn't too short or too tall. Too short may cause you to bend over, making it tougher on your back, or vice versa, too tall will cause you to have to reach up more often, causing arm fatigue. To help organize my squares, grinders, flat discs, and other items, I designed in the pegboard system. For anything larger, I designed in a storage rack for the bottom base. I kept it pretty simple as I expect changes as I evolve with the table. Now that I have most of the details worked out, I created a build plan and a shopping list of what I would need to get. I'll leave a link in the description for the build plans if you want to follow along. To pick up the steel material, I rented a trailer and went to my local metal yard. Unloading was a bit of a challenge. A forklift would have been nice right now. Luckily, I was able to call up a good friend to help out. It was a little tricky, but eventually we got it unloaded. I started first making cuts for the cross bracing and the table legs. To make repeatable cuts, I made a simple jig that would serve as a stop. To knock off the burrs that were left over after the cuts, I used a metal belt grinder. For the table legs, I used some 2.5 square tubing and then cut and drilled out the holes for the caster plate. 
As I was welding the legs to the plate, I made sure to allow clearance for the bolt hole for when I installed the casters. So now that the legs are done, we're actually gonna build the top part of the framing. Um, you can see right now we have um, one half done. I'm actually gonna show you guys how to do the second half. And after that, I'm gonna connect the two together. So that's kind of the breakdown of the top frame. And yeah, we'll see how it goes. So when we put our legs up, there'll be this gap right here. We'll need to shave down the, uh, the weld so that it's smooth. And then this could butt up against it nice and, nice and flush and be exactly perpendicular to this piece here. And I'll use something like this on a die grinder. Um, it's kind of a, one of those round bits here. Um, you can actually use a flat disc if you have one of those curved flat discs to get in it. But this is kind of what I have right now. So we're just gonna use this. Now was to get the four table legs welded to the cross bracing. After everything was welded, now was a good time to install the casters. Cutting the table plate. There's a few ways to go about this. I use a circular saw with the metal cement plate. To be honest, I wasn't too confident, especially cutting through half inch thick plate across a long stretch. To keep the saw tracking straight, I used some flat bar as a guide. I started with the short distance first to see how this would pan out. I would go about 10 inches, then stop and let my saw take a break or until my batteries took a dump. To my surprise, it actually cut okay and left the clean surface. The other side, however, didn't go so well. I realized the blade had prematurely dull. I tried cutting slower, but noticed the blade wandering. Instead, I went back to the traditional carbide disc because it was cheaper, and this time, instead of trying to cut through half inch steel in one pass, I would make a series of multiple passes, cutting incremental depths of about a sixteenth. And this time, I wore a full face mask. After making a series of passes, this seemed to do the trick. I wanted to find an accurate and consistent way to drill these fixing holes. I then saw a video made by a YouTuber named Retroworld, and he seemed like he made a homemade jig and he used a 5 inch angry cutter attached to a mag drill. Now if you have access to a CNC laser or a water jet, even better. But today, we're gonna focus on how we can get this done using basic tools. To make this jig, the first thing I did was butt up the mag drill to the angle to measure the distance to the pilot pin. Then mark the center to center hole distance. To make my first set of drill holes, I positioned the angle on the table and drilled through both the angle and the half inch plate. Once it appears, you wanna make sure the mag drill is butt flush against the angle before each hole is drilled. You can look at this like your datum or reference point. To do the next set of holes, I would need to add three plates to the jig and drill the holes so that they were positioned three inches on center from the hole previously drilled on the angle. Hopefully this makes sense. After getting the three plates positioned, I tacked them into place. This completed the jig to drill the remaining holes more consistently. Here's a quick concept I simulated using SolidWorks. To keep the jig from moving, I used my fiction clamps and used 5-8 shoulder bolts instead of the standard ones because they held the tight tolerance. This would help reduce the tolerance stack as each set of holes were drilled. After I finished my second set of holes, to check for proper hole alignment, I used a long square to see if my holes are straight and perpendicular to one another. You want to do this for each set of holes drilled to make sure everything is still lining up. It took me about 2 hours to do 39 holes. 14 hours later, 270 holes were drilled. I was pretty happy how the jig had performed. To give the table a more professional look and to break the sharp edges left by the drilled holes, they needed to be chamfered. 
to get good results. I actually got a tip from 6L Designs. He recommended that I use a wood router with variable speed and set it to the lowest setting uh, using a carbide toque flute chamfer router bit. I then set my desired depth and speed and plank. I was actually surprised how well this worked. It left a clean, uniform chamfer. To do the other side, I used my engine hoist with some straps and eyeballs to flip it over. To keep me from catching the four corners of the table, I rounded it off using a flap disc and chamfered the edges. I think adding power is a great option for a welding table. Most of the time, I find myself having multiple tools plugged in. I thought about using a power strip, but decided to wire up some boxes because being able to access power at any of the four corners just makes things easier. Also, it seems to be a more durable and permanent solution. At first, I was going to weld the top plate to the frame with a series of tags underneath, but I was afraid it would cause a plate to warp. Instead, I decided to bolt down the plate using some countersink bolts. I then measured and marked where my holes would be drilled. You can see here, I used some half inch bolts to temporarily keep the plate sandwiched down and to prevent the plate from shifting while I drilled. I grabbed my mag drill and swapped out the head for a drill chuck. I drilled through the table plate and tab using a slightly larger bit to give the bolt some wiggle room. Then use a one inch countersink bit and drill to a depth until the head of the screw was flush with the table. I had about 28 of these to do and lucky I got a little help from my little three year old son. <laughs> then for the last time, remove the top plate yet again to give better access to the tabs to finish up the welds. While the tabletop was off, I figured this would be a good time to get the catch trays installed. Now it's time to put the tabletop back onto the frame for the last time. Originally when I was building my table legs, I left this area to allow clearance for my legs for when I would sit down at the table and work. But I also knew I wanted a place to store large items. After weighing the pros and cons, I went in the direction of having more storage space. I decided to give the metal cutting blade another try. And this time it cut like butter, especially on thinner sheets. I used it to cut down some 6 gauge perforated metal that were served as the rack. After it was cut to size, I then notched the corners to clear the table legs. To install it, I used some self-tapping screws. This would allow me to easily remove it for when I would paint the frame or change something down the line. To organize items that I would use frequently, I incorporated a metal pegboard into the table. I've seen this used on the walls of a garage and I thought it would be a good idea to have an installer on the table. I went with one made by a company called Wall Controls. Normally this would be installed into wood studs, but because it was going on a welding table, I used some 5H tubing and slid it behind the form part of the pegboard. To keep the install clean, I riveted them in and installed the board onto the table using some fasteners. So the table sits pretty flat right now, and I think I can make it even flatter. Um, the way we mounted the table to the actual table frame, uh, we're gonna, with, those, with those tabs, uh, we're gonna use those nuts and adjust it so that it's even more flatter. So I'll kind of show you how I do that here with this uh, quick example. So here's my mock-up of how I'm gonna adjust the top plate or adjust flatness. Um, well, with at least half inch at least, this is your top welding plate, and this is the tab that was welded underneath. Um, so how we're gonna adjust flatness is pretty much, um, you have your countersink screws here, which is this screw here, and then you have your three nuts underneath. So let's say you had a low spot. So let's exaggerate that real quick. So this is a low spot, you can see, and you wanted to adjust it up. What you would wanna do is first loosen the bottom nut and then tighten this nut so that it raises up. You see that there? 
um, and vice versa. So let's say you had a high spot and you needed to bring it down, loosen this guy up and then tighten it and then tighten both nuts so that it won't go anywhere. After adjusting the bolts and nuts while using a long leveler, I was able to get the table flat to an allowable flatness. After a few weekends, I finally have a welding table that puts a smile on my face every time I work on it. And this grid layout of holes across the table now lets me use a wide range of fixturing accessories. In turn helps me hold pieces in place, allows me for better alignment and support while I weld. Overall, that's my process of how I built this table. It took a minute, wasn't easy, but was absolutely worth the effort. For me, the learning part is why I do DIY projects like this. I got to use a mag drill for the first time. I always get a chance to improve and I get to learn to cut steel sheet in different ways. Because this table is so versatile, I try to find any reason to use it even for woodworking projects. I now feel more confident in the quality of work and the result I can produce. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe for more stuff like this. That's it for me. Thanks for watching.